as we saw in <clears throat> our study last week, King Solomon was told by God to, quote, ask, what shall I give you? And let me read from a portion of uh, scripture in Second, in Second Chronicles that gives us a very clear picture of what took place at this time. Second Chronicles chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. <clears throat> now Solomon, the son of David, was strengthened in his kingdom, and the Lord his God was with him and exalted him exceedingly. And Solomon spoke to all Israel, to the captains of thousands and of hundreds, to the judges and to every leader in all Israel, the heads of the fathers' houses. Then Solomon and all the assembly with him went to the high place that was at Gibeon, for the tabernacle of meeting with God was there, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, had made in the wilderness. But David had brought up the ark of God from Kir Kirjath-Jarim to the place David had prepared for it, for he had pitched a tent for it at Jerusalem. Now the bronze altar that Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Ur, had made, he put before the tabernacle of the Lord. And Solomon and the assembly sought him there, that is, sought the Lord there. And Solomon went up there to the bronze altar before the Lord, which was at the tabernacle of meeting, and he offered a thousand burnt offerings on it. And on that night, in a vision, God appeared to Solomon and said to him, Ask, what shall I give you? And Solomon said to God, You have shown great mercy to David my father, and have made me king in this place, in his place. Now, O Lord God, let your promise to David my father be established, for you have made me king over a people like the dust of the earth in multitude. Now give me wisdom and knowledge that I may go out and come in before this people, for who can judge this great people of yours? Then said to Solomon, then God said to Solomon, because this was in your heart, and you have not asked riches or wealth or honor or the life of your enemies, nor have you asked long life for yourself, but have asked wisdom and knowledge for yourself that you may judge my people over whom I have made you king. Wisdom and knowledge, because of all this, wisdom and knowledge are granted to you, and I will give you riches and wealth and honor, such as none of the kings have had who were before you, nor shall any other after you have the like. So, that's kind of a pretty clear picture of where we are at this point. Now, it's one thing to have wisdom, but quite another thing to use it properly. And for King Solomon, right out of the box, he was faced with a situation that required some great wisdom, and wisdom at a great wit risk, as we're going to see. Two harlots, two prostitutes, were quarreling over which one was the actual mother of a baby. Even though their social status was extremely low, nevertheless, they came to King Solomon to get help in solving their dispute. And when Solomon threatened to divide the baby with the sword into two equal parts, the uh, mother was revealed by her desire to spare the child, that is a true mother, even if she didn't get the baby for herself. And as a result, such wisdom caused Solomon to be greatly revered and respected in all of Israel. So <clears throat> let's go down through this uh, test of Solomon's wisdom and see what takes place. Verse 16, chapter 3, verse 16. It says, Now two women who were harlots came to the king and stood before him. Now these two... Um, I want, you to, I want you to, first of all, note the right of accession, in other words, uh, to, the Lord, to the king's presence, where, where they can come to the king's presence on the part of, a com, of common members of the king, kingdom. 
these two women uh, probably lived together with other prostitutes in a, in a uh, home, or a, more literally a brothel. And although the law of Moses uh, laid down some severe restrictions against prostitution, uh, it's, a, it's a mystery, but they tolerated it. Just like there are certain, certain things, and this is a lesson to us, there are certain things that are part of, um, of uh, procedures and policies of churches that are indeed scriptural, but sometimes, depending on situations, it's called situation ethics, if you please, uh, we have a tendency to, to sidestep those things. And instead of saying, okay, this is what our procedure and policy is based upon what the scripture says. And when we do that, we just open the door. And so even at this time, even though prostitution was um, just forbidden in the law of Moses, um, yet Israel tolerated it. Okay, and so we have this situation now. And even though uh, the law of Moses had laid down some severe restrictions and prosti against prostitution and punishments for its activity, Solomon allowed the two women to come before him. And so I see here a, a key thing here regarding Solomon's wisdom. No condensation. Is that a right word? No condon. Yeah, that's what I got here. Condon. But I, what did I say? Oh, condensation. No, no condensation. He didn't look down on these people. I mean, here he was. God had already promised him uh, great wisdom, like he'd asked for. And in addition to that, uh, we just read there from Second Chronicles where God says. I'm not only going to give you great wisdom and knowledge that you asked for, but you're going to be rich. And then we're going to see, um, <clears throat> I'm going to refer to Second Chronicles again next week as we see just how rich and famous and everything like that are primarily rich right out of the, right out of the box Solomon became. So sometimes when we reach a certain plateau of prominent status, human nature, we want to be condescending. We see that a lot of times in, in churches. A lot of times we forget where we come from. We see this from time to time at the mission. We, we need to constantly remind the guys to remember where they came from. That even you take somebody like uh, Chris Andrews, who was here a week ago and, and shared with the men. Uh, Chris, homeless, horrible situation. And Chris, he says, one of the first things I realize when I get up in the morning is, and I come down and see the guests that are there and have spent the night, I got to remember that I used to be there. And we can't forget. We can't forget where we came from. And uh, Solomon, I think, he reached a point where he didn't take into account where he'd come from. But at this point, he does. So he, he brings the two prostitutes in. And notice verse 17. And one woman said, O oh my Lord, this woman, referring to the woman that she brings in, and I dwell in the same house, and I gave birth while she was still in the house. While she was in the house. Then it happened the third day after I had given birth that this woman also gave birth and we were together. No one was with us in the house except the two of us in the house. Now, no one was with us in the house. Since there were no witnesses to what had taken place and no witnesses to the birth of the two babies, or the death of the one, the case couldn't be tried in the courts 
in the normal way. And it would be one woman's word, as we know, one woman's word against the word of the other, even though it was obvious that one of the women was a liar. Okay? And so the actual mother, she continues. Notice verse 19. And this woman's son died. So she's, she's pointing to this woman who's there. And this woman's son died in the night because she lay on him. So she arose in the middle of the night, took my son from my side, kidnapped him, basically, stole him, while your maid servant slept, and laid him in her bosom, and laid her deaf child in my bosom. And when I arose in the morning to nurse my son, there he was, dead. But when I had examined him in the morning, indeed he was not my son, whom I had born. Now, that's the situation. So the one woman lays it out. And then the lying woman speaks for the first time. She goes, no, but the living one is my son, and the dead one is your son. I, uh, Nancy and I watched Judge Judy uh, Shilin from time to time on TV, and, and uh, she'll have one person give, give uh, their defense, and then she'll turn the other one and, and, and so many words say, so what say you? And of course the other one is gonna disagree. And Judge Judy goes, okay, now we got a case. Now let's go from here. And so the, the living woman, or the, the lying woman, she speaks. The living one is my son. The dead one is your son. And then to watch the actual mother responds, no, but the dead one is your own son and the living one is my son. So then King Solomon makes it clear that he, that he has heard uh, both women correctly. And, and this, I mean, Solomon is going to act here as, as uh, judge and jury to the whole situation. And so uh, when, when you're in a court of law and you're faced with this situation, a lot of time the judge will, only in this case Solomon is going to be that judge, then he, he repeats back what has been said. So people, and not only in the courtroom, but can understand, say, okay, yeah, that's what it was. So Solomon, in verse 23, notice what he says. And the king said, the one says, this is my son who lives, and your son is the dead one. And the other says, no, but your son is the dead one, and my son is the living one. So everything was clear. But now notice what he does. He says, then the king said, bring me a sword. Hmm. What do you think they're, they're thinking? What do you think the ladies, help me out here, what do you think the ladies here are thinking at this point? I think I'd be thinking, what in the heck is he going to do? Yeah. Yeah. Solomon, I think at this point, he pretty much knows what he's going to do. And I try and put myself in the position of any of the characters that are involved in some of these stories. And I think about the two ladies. One was lying, one wasn't. What they must have been thinking when Solomon asked for the sword. And then... Solomon is getting his wisdom from the Lord. And I'd like to get into the mind of Solomon 
when all of a sudden I think God ministers to him and said, ask for a sword. Mm. Interesting, huh? Abraham and Isaac brings us to mind when Abraham would have offered Isaac upon the altar. And, and the scripture says that Abraham held the knife and was about to slay his son. And at the last moment, angel of the Lord speaks. And so using the divine wisdom that God gave him, and I want to speak to, to Solomon's uh, compassion here. I think, Nancy, that, that Solomon did have a compassion because I think he knew what he was going to do. But I think the women, from their standpoint, probably were thinking, he doesn't have any compassion at all. He's just going to kill this baby. Take care of the situation. So using the divine wisdom God gave him, Solomon bypasses the word of the women and he goes right to their hearts. I read this a long time ago and then I, I searched through and wanted to make sure I got it right. I could never find the, the exact quote, but I think I got it right. And someone has rightly said, and I read this a long time ago, the heart of every problem is the problem in the heart. Scripture says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And it also goes without saying that out of the abundance of what's going on in your heart, you act. Displays your actions. Shows your actions. Uh, the heart is deceitful above all things. Desperately wicked. And we see that going on a lot of times in our world today. The, the heartlessness of, uh, of people. And so Solomon's solution, verse 25. And the king said, divide the living child in two and give half to one and half to the other. Ugh. Wow. Contemplate that for a minute. Think about what's, what Solomon's suggesting here. But he has a purpose in mind. He wants to get, like I just mentioned, right to the heart of these two ladies. And then, verse 26, first part of it, Then the woman whose son was living spoke to the king. Hmm. And she learned with she yearned with compassion for her son, and she said, "Oh my Lord, give her the living child, and by no means kill me." So she, the heart of the living mother, of the lying mother, is going to be revealed. But immediately here, when Solomon says, "You know, divide the the baby in half," the heart of the true mom is made known right away. She says, oh, stop. Stop. And give her the living child. Don't kill the child. Give her the living child and by no means kill him. Mm. But now notice the heart of the lying woman. And she said, but, but the other said, let him be neither mine nor yours, but go ahead and divide him. There's, there's the epitome of the fact that the human heart is desperately evil above all things. Desperately wicked, like we just said. And so Solomon's judgment is this. So the king answered and said, Give the first woman the living child and by no means kill him. She is his mother. Hmm. Short story. But I think the lesson to us, a couple lessons here. 
Solomon was not condescending. He did have great wisdom. I think sometimes that Solomon was even surprised at the wisdom that he had. And he would later on misuse it. We're going to see that. I think Solomon was surprised that God, in addition to giving him his wisdom, was going to give, give him all of this, this wealth and prosperity. Solomon misused that as well. Okay? And so we got to understand. we got to be careful as leaders especially. When we reach a point where we, we, we have a certain amount of authority that we still need to be humble. We need to be humble. Realize where we came from. Where we came from. David said, I remember my frame that I'm but dust. That God breathed into Adam, took the dust to the ground, breathed into Adam the breath of life, man became a living being. And so we need to, we need to realize that. We came from dust, we're going to go back to dust. Okay. And so we need to, to, to be humble. We need, and, and we need to ask the Lord for wisdom. Solomon could ask for a lot of things. God laid that out for him. He says, you didn't, you didn't ask for to, to live a long life. You didn't ask for the, you know, um, you, for the death of your enemies or potential enemies. You simply asked for wisdom and knowledge. Solomon was young, probably about 20 years old. And so he, he ascends to the throne. He's just a kid. He needs wisdom on knowing what to do. Sometimes... I see this with younger pastors. Sometimes you just shake their head and say, when are they going to get some wisdom? Right, Pastor? How old are you, Pastor? 67. 67. I'm 77. <clears throat> and, and to see the culture in churches today with, with young leadership, hmm, one of the most thriving churches within our Southern Baptist Convention is called Sandals Church. It was a church plant by a young young man. And uh, he was in his early 20s. It was at Cal Baptist Seminary, Cal, Cal Baptist Seminary when I first met him. And <clears throat> his dad, Ed Young was, was the director of men's ministries in the state of California for many years. And way back when, when this church did a big remodel, Ed Young came up here and was helping involve himself with that and laying stuff out and getting teams to come in and do that. But I remember going to the booth where this young man had set up at the, there at the Southern Baptist Convention and I asked him, I says, so what is your greatest prayer need? He said, we need older men with wisdom. The church had only been in existence in a, for about a year. It was down in the San Bernardino area. <clears throat> and already they were running about 1,000 people. And which was not unusual for a good church taken off in that populated area down there. But he, he, want, he said, we need older men. He said, probably 80% of our congregation is under the age of 25. And he was about that same age, a little bit less. So he said, we need wisdom. And I put my hand on him. I called a couple other guys over and we laid hands on him and, and prayed for him. And it was interesting to see a few years later when we had an evangelism conference, this young man was one of the speakers. And 
<clears throat> it was interesting for him to say, I remember a time when we first got started and God gave me wisdom and, and to, to send out a plea for older men to come in and help us out, give us wisdom, give us guidance. And then he just went around the room and pointed out by name several men that were now part of his congregation that God had brought in, God had raised up. And some of them had come to know the Lord. And even though they were young in the Lord, some of them, yet they had a great amount of wisdom because of the years that they were. And uh, so now we have, a, and he listed, you know, the, the range of age that they now had. And he says, now we got some men that are in their 60s, 70s, and 80s who God is using. So I think we need to understand that too, to, to just send out a, a, a prayer for wisdom and knowing how to, how to guide the affairs of our lives, okay? Um, we're not told <coughs> what uh, Solomon did with the mother who had lied and, and had stolen or kidnapped the baby, and nor do we have any words in Scripture regarding the true mother. Uh, we can only hope and trust that the true mother abandoned her sinful prostitute ways and raised her son in the ways of the Lord, but we have no way of knowing. And as for Solomon, notice verse 28. And all Israel heard of the judgment which the king had rendered, and they feared the king, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to administer justice. And not only the, the whole uh, kingdom of Israel, all Israel, but the nations around them heard about Solomon and wisdom and would often send envoys to the palace where Solomon was to ask him for wisdom in settling some of their disputes. And Solomon, again, was not condescending, and he would do that, give them wisdom. Now Josephus, you've heard of Josephus? the well-known Jewish historian, commenting on this situation, he says this, Now the multitude looked on this determination as a great sign and demonstration of the king's keen intelligence, shrewdness, and wisdom. And after that day, attended to him as to one that had a divine mind. Now this is a, a well-known Jewish historian, not a believer, who was just commenting on these times. And uh, that's what he had to say about this period. So he, being a historian, secular historian, if you please, but commenting on this, what we see in scripture, gives us insight as to what the people there. Josephus was kind of an on-site on reporter. And it's inter interesting. You can get, uh, I, I got it, I got two volumes, one that I got, had given to me years ago, and then another one that I picked up in a used bookstore a few years back, which was expanded and, and, and uh, given with extra notes and everything of stuff that he had done. If you ever get a chance, the works of Josephus, get a hold of a copy, and it's interesting to, and there's a nice index in this, this uh, version that I got here a few years ago, there's a nice index which refers, you know, you can look up Solomon and how he handled the situation with the two harlots. You can go there and it shows you what he says. So a good, a good source for Bible study and, and work. So <clears throat> I think what we can learn, not only as leaders, but as just people in the church, don't forget where we came from. Don't forget where we came from. I've never forgotten that I was once a snot-nosed kid in Myers Flat who broke windows in a school and could have wound up in a juvenile hall. But instead, I wound up in God's kingdom a few years later. And so <clears throat> we can't forget where we came from. Can't forget where we came from. Pastor shared a little bit about where he came from. We can't forget that. And then reach out to people and be consistent. If there's anything that we can hold against Solomon, he wasn't consistent. You know, he was, he just took off like gangbusters and then he 
gather all kinds of wealth, and we'll see that in the days ahead. Any questions or comments? Yeah. Well, this is kind of a tangent, but given that the woman who took the baby obviously didn't have any maternal instincts towards it even anyway, what would there have been for her to gain by this whole charade in the first place? Don't know. <coughs> Don't know. This just entered my mind this morning as you were teaching, and I never thought about it before, with these houses of prostitution and no real form of birth control in those days. They must have had a lot of pregnant women and young children without fathers, which is similar to a lot of what we have going on today, with children being raised by mothers without fathers and contributing to the dysfunction. Just a thought. Yep. Pardon? It wasn't unusual to sell children either. It wasn't. It wasn't unusual for something like this to happen. We had pretty much every different chance of yeah. having Yeah. And sometimes, keep this in mind, not all the time, but sometimes having a child of your own was a way out of prostitution because other social. Uh, social programs would, would take you in and help you care for that child. And who knows, maybe she was tired of her life of prostitution, we don't know. So that's one, one thing. Yeah, they, they probably had, had, you know, I mean, even, even though it's a New Testament teaching where it says take care of the orphans and widows, there was, there was stuff that were, was under the law that, that allowed for taking care of people who were poor and, and stuff like that. Take them in and, and help care for them. Okay. It's interesting at the women's shelter right now, I mean, Kristen, the women's shelter director, she really has a heart for unwed mothers. And, and she, oh man, she just reaches out to them. And you, you, walk into that, you walk into that women's shelter first thing in the morning when their kids are running around and they're feeding you, you think, where are all these kids come from? And they're just loaded with children, kids, and everything like that. And, and Every time you turn around, you anytime I've walked over there to take something over, and Kristen's there, she's always walking around, you know, with instructions on what to do in one hand, and a little baby in the other, holding some mama's baby. So, uh, do a good work there. Pastor, what do you have? Who are you listening to? Who? There we go. Who are you? Listening to a lot of voices out there today, we we see it, we continue to see it and hear it. And so let's see what we have today. So thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you for your word. As we get further into this life of Solomon, continue to teach us stuff that we can apply to our lives today. In Jesus' name, Amen.